Operator, thank you, Senator Warner. Um, and a, a lot of things for us to be thinking about uh, as we uh, move forward here. And thank you for your steadfast support for transit transportation uh, across our region. And uh, you know, we agree this is an actual moment where we can think differently about how we as a region can come together and use our assets much more effectively in transit and transportation and a whole host of other areas as well. Uh, you know, the Board of Trade's been uh, at this for a long time. You know, well, sometimes it's interesting. The Board of Trade was founded in 1889. And uh, way back in the 1900s, we were involved in the original drafting of the original street extension plans. We've been advocating for airports. We've been advocating for public transit. We've been advocating for bridges. We've been advocating for the American Legion Bridge, almost a chill the spot, but we will continue to advocate for resources needed to address that project uh, and so many others. I mean, we are only as effective as how well we can get around. So uh, let's continue to work together to make that happen. So I'm really pleased to bring up the key transportation officials from across the region uh, to have a conversation with us next. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Chef Miller, the, the Virginia Secretary of Transportation, Paul Wienefels, uh, Maryland Transportation Secretary, and Sharon Kirschbaum, the DC Director uh, of the DC's Department of Transportation. Uh, friends and colleagues all, so thank you very much. And uh, Adam, Adam Tux. <laughs> from News 4 is gonna join us to facilitate this conversation. So uh, Adam, thank you for that. I should know how the microphone works. This one works. Good to see everybody this morning. Uh, thank you to the Board of Trade. Thank you to the Greater Washington Partnership for having me here. I love asking questions, especially transportation questions. Sharon loves me when I ask her about bike lanes. She's been telling me a lot about that recently. Um, but no, this is really a great opportunity for all of us to get together. It's a shame we're crunched for time because I was going to roast Randy for about 30 minutes here, uh, but I don't have that time, so we got to get right into it. And uh, I think we can just go down the line uh, and start with what everyone has been talking about. You know, Metro really is the tie that binds all of us together uh, in this region. And you're starting to hear much more about not just having to fund Metro. I mean, we all know that. I've been covering Metro for 20 years, and it's always the same thing almost every year. We need more funding for the transit agency. Uh, but how do you do that? What is the mechanism? And I think for the first time really um, in recent history, we're starting to hear more about things like a sales tax, some sort of sort of dedicated tax that would go toward uh, part of the transit system, a way that everyone kind of pays their fair share. But what is a fair share? Let's, let's start with Secretary Wiedefeld. I mean, Paul, so if we think about it from Maryland's perspective, Sure, a sales tax could go to, to Metro, but you also have a transit system in Baltimore to think about, you have an airport to think about. How would the state of Maryland specifically look at something like a sales tax and then decide whether or not that's the right option? Thank you, um, and thank you for inviting us here. Um, yeah, as you, as you mentioned, you know, we're a little different in that we are a consolidated transportation department. We have six and a third modes, right? A third being the Metro, being the third portion of it. Um, and we fund it out of one source and we fund Metro totally out of that source as well. So it's a challenge that we're facing now across the board. Um, so we have roughly $1.3 billion hole in our current program. We've had to stop all construction projects that run under construction. We've had to basically stop all projects that are clean and environmental. We are uh, basically do not have the ability to match our federal dollars. So that is a much larger issue for us. So yes, the, the metro is very important, and we're, we're obviously going to support it, but it has to be done in that larger context. And whether that's other revenue, sales tax, or any other source, that will be a discussion you know, that we'll have in our, in our uh, legislative cycle coming up. Um, but it's, for us, it's a much larger issue uh, to, to address, and not just the metro by itself, because I have Mark, I have commuter bus, I have the operating transit system, I have American Legion Bridge, um, uh, so there's just a series of things that we have to run here here. Really. I mean, it's you know it well as the former head of Metro. I mean, the, the, the funding challenges that go for it. Is a sales tax viable in your opinion? Do you think that that makes sense? Uh, it could. I, I think um, I know. I know there's been a lot of work done. I think we also have to really, really peel back some of the complexities of what we're facing now in terms of tri different travel behavior. I mean, the, the you know the sort of hard numbers when you start to look at them. You know, there was a, almost a decade plus where ridership uh, was roughly almost 700,000 boarding per day. 
and now I'm on the rail side. Now I don't know where we're up in the 400 range. So with that became with that came a lot of revenue, right? That is no longer there. So that is part of this problem that we have to sort of get our arms around. Um, so yes, obviously there's the need for more money, but if we're providing a service that is valued very highly in the upper 90s, right? But yet travel has changed. So how do we wrestle with that issue and the loss of revenue that that you know, those additional riders brought to the table? So it, it, I think it's a very complex issue that we're all trying to still understand. Um, and it plays out on our highway system. And it plays out, obviously, on the, on the uh, commercial um, office space market. It, you know, play, it plays out at so many levels. Uh, so I think just to look at it sort of, you know, just one aspect of it is important, but I think we've got to broaden our view of this issue. Okay, Director Kirschbaum, uh, obviously we know how important Metro is it, to the entire region, but specifically to, to the district. Uh, the mayor, full supporter of it, a former Metro board member. Do you think DC would ever get on board with an additional tax to go toward the transit system, a, another funding mechanism, and, and what kind of discussions have you had on that level? Thanks, Adam. And the good news is um, the DMV move process is giving us great scaffolding to really explore what the alternatives are. Um, I can just say uh, we as a district are completely intertwined in terms of the success of Metro. So finding a sustainable uh, funding source is critical to us. Um, our revitalization of downtown is really dependent on um, a healthy transit system. And we know when people are riding Metro or taking a bus, they're on their feet and they're walking and they're going into retail and commercial enterprises. and. That is all really pivotal to helping us um, revitalize back downtown. So we need to make it happen. Um, we are open to all of the alternatives that are on the table and really glad that we have the DMV moves process to help Shepard through a good choice. All right, and uh, Secretary Miller, what, what's the climate like in Virginia when you know you hear year after year, Metro needs more money. Okay, we plugged the gap this year, then we're back the next year. Metro needs some more money. Do you think it's time that there's a dedicated source of revenue uh, directly for Metro, other than, you know, what's coming from the federal government? Um, let me dispel a myth in Virginia. We have a dedicated source of revenue for Vermont every year. It's dedicated, it's locked up, that's where it's going, and it's dedicated. If the problem is, it, in Vermont's eyes, is not enough. So we do have a dedicated stream, and I, and I would agree with those folks who would take issue with a 16-year-old with a, uh, uh, Priya and capital funding formula that hasn't been changed and set and static. I don't personally believe that's ever a good thing. And because here we are, we, we do that many times in government. We set something and we leave it alone for 10 years and then we fight about it again. And in the meantime, you get sort of jacked around. And I don't think that's a good process, so I don't like that. Um, let me say this, that um, we're, we're excited about the management in Vermont. We know they have a very tough job, and we salute Randy and his team. Um, but we have a different view in some respects. And, and I'll tell you, um, Randy talked about the savings and 275 million and, and this and that. And they're doing good hard work. And listen, they've got some difficult issues there. But they saved 50 million dollars out of 2.5 billion. 50 million, okay? And that's not a big number to us. So we still think, and yeah, there, there are all sorts of issues, and we don't have time to get into that. The, the fixed and variable cost and the sort of the sprawl of the system and the density of the, of the, uh, the population base here versus where the metro goes. My colleague talked about the decline in ridership and shifting patterns and what all that means. Um, but at the end of the day, um, Virginia's funding about $600 million, almost $700 million this year into WMATA. And um, the concept of another couple, of, a couple hundred million or 300 million is not going to sit well in our administration. Um, how the rest of Virginia looks at that and what a following administration may or may not do, I can't speak to it, but it's really tough when you go down to Taylor's Landing and, and Southwest Virginia has been decimated by hurricanes and so forth and say, you know, we got to take this money and, and put it into more money, another couple hundred million more into a model. Now, having said that, we all know how important it is, right? So nobody's against a model, nobody just doesn't believe in, in, in transit. We just need it to be more efficient and more cost effective than it is. 
and that's a difficult uh, chore that Randy and his team have in the work and work So it sounds like you think there's more operational savings that they could be looking toward or something along those lines before we get into a discussion about additional funding? Well, I, you know, I, I just say this. You got 50 million on 2.5 billion. You tell me. Uh -huh. All right. Well, there you go. There you have it. Um, Let's talk, uh, you know, I want to get as many topics in here as I can, and I know that we're, we're, we're tight on time. Five years ago, when I had the uh, honor of hosting this event, we signed what was called the Capital Beltway Accord. I didn't sign it. The governors of Maryland and Virginia signed it. And at that time, it was Governor Northam and uh, Governor Hogan. And they said that we are going to soon have a new American Legion bridge. And we do not have a new American Legion Bridge. We have the same American Legion Bridge, which by some estimates is gonna to have to be replaced in the next 10 or so years, or something significant is gonna to have to be done with it. That's at least from what I've reported and what people have told me. Uh, Paul, what's gonna happen with the American Legion sure. Bridge? Uh, again, it gets back to this core issue that we just talked about, right? There's a dollar attached to that that we have to figure out. Obviously, there's a critical need just to maintain that bridge, obviously, and make sure that it, it continues to function. Um, and then longer term, what does that look like? That's a different issue. But the initial issue is how would we fund something of that scale? Uh, at the same time, we're, we're, we're wrestling with how do we support the, the metro system, which is so important. But uh, you know, from our perspective, they're all important, right? And we've got to work through that, and, and we will. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that just changed that you know, are in play now that we have to rethink. How does that play out with that project and other projects across the state? Do you see a new bridge in the next decade or so or something being done? Obviously, we're gonna to have to do, do something to that bridge to make sure it functionally operates, right? Because as you know, you just mentioned whatever time frame you mentioned. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's clearly a functional issue that we have to deal with. Whether or not that is different than what we see out there today, that's a different issue. Director Kirschbaum, I'm not trying to skip over you, but I am going to skip over to you just to come to this side of the beltway. Uh, Secretary, from your perspective, from Virginia's perspective, you know, you can't do too much to it because it's under Maryland's control, the, the Legion Bridge. So what should happen there? You guys are building express lanes right up to it, pretty much, uh, kind of leaving it open in terms of what's going to happen next, whether or not Maryland decides to run express lanes across the bridge and then onto the Maryland side of the beltway. What, in your opinion, should be happening with the Legion Bridge right now? I think that's a Maryland decision, sir. It's a sovereign, it's a sovereign state. We built up to the edge. We we're more than willing to partner with them and have them. Um, but that's their citizens and their government's decision, not Virginia's decision. We certainly have an opinion what we'd like to see, but I think it's a bit presumptuous, frankly, for one state to tell another state how they have to operate. That's not who we elect to, to run us. And I think Mr. Wheelfield and his governor and the legislature, they need to make that decision. Obviously, it's a problem, right? It's a, it's a transportation problem, and it affects people in Virginia, so we have a, a thought about it. But at the end of the day, it's a problem that they need to solve, and we'll certainly support them any way that we can that makes sense to us. But I think it's a Maryland issue. With all due respect, though, some of the, a lot of the problems that we run into when it comes to transportation is this lack of regional thinking, right? And a lot of this DMV move stuff is regional thinking. A lot of the things that we're talking about here is not acting as own separate individuals, but working together. So is it it's your purview that they should just figure it out and then you'll go along with whatever they do? Well, it's their, you know, under the laws of our, of our government, it's their decision, not ours. Um, we can sort of play in that pool a little bit because of we are a region, and obviously we have a, 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 an interest that's aligned in terms of the region. But at the end of the day, um, it's going to be Maryland dollars that fund it. It's going to be Maryland that makes the decision, and that's the people that, that are funding it, the people that own it, should make the decision, not their neighbors, in my view. And so, yeah, it impacts us. We, we want it to be improved. I think the secretary and the governor want it to be improved. They have real issues that they're trying to, to balance there, and we understand that. Um, and, and so we're ready, willing, and able. We've been um, supportive along the way. We'll continue to be. We'll partner with them. They partner with us. But um, until you form some sort of regional government that has true taxing power, and I, I just don't see that happening in the term, 
then the government that owns it needs to own it and run it, and not some other government. All right. Director Kirschbaum, uh, speaking of bridges, one of the main things you and I had a sit-down interview, you told me that the, the Roosevelt Bridge is going to need to be replaced at some point in time. Uh, you know, everyone up here is talking about funding challenges. No one is making a secret of that. Changing commuting patterns, all sorts of different things and different challenges. Is that project still on the table? What can you tell us about that? Sure, absolutely. So the Theodore Roosevelt Bridge um, has been in pretty serious uh, deteriorating state, and we will begin construction in 2025. It's going to be a four-year process. Um, so not only is it a major upgrade um, in terms of the deck and the piers, we're actually going to be expanding the sidewalk um, along it. So it's four feet now. That'll be a 10-foot trail. So we're really excited. It will not only sustain and make sure we have a, a long-standing bridge, but really help encourage folks to use it for reasons other than the 95,000 vehicles that cross every day. Gotcha. So one of the projects that we can look forward to is the, is the Roosevelt Bridge when coming up uh, in the near future. Another big thing that's been going on in the district, and we'll let you keep talking, is uh, the Clear Lanes bus program. This has gotten a lot of attention with the metro buses now that can go and, and pick out people who are in bus-only lanes. And I've heard from so many people who have said, but I wasn't even, I wasn't even stopped in the bus lane. I wasn't, but you were in the bus lane, right? You know, and so it's hard to have sympathy with when you told people, you warned people, and then here come the fines. But nevertheless, what's the update with that? I mean, we've seen thousands and thousands of fines, but it, it speaks to also the problem of people clogging up bus lanes, right? Everyone's talking about uh, a regional bus network or a fast moving bus rapid network system. You can't do that if people are clogging up the bus lanes, right? Absolutely, and I'm going to just give a quick contextual um, description of why they're so important. So our priority bus lanes, and people think of those as the red painted lanes, they're the dedicated bus lanes. Um, there's many other features uh, in terms of queue jumps, in terms of other signaling that helps the buses move more efficiently. We often rebalance where the stops are so um, the buses can move more efficiently. So the priority bus lanes alone um, really reduce travel times by about 15%. When you then couple it with the enforcement element, which is the Clear Lanes program, um, and that is cameras on the buses, um, we have seen the efficiency of these buses go um, closer to 25 to 30% in terms of travel time. So yes, nobody likes to get a ticket. Um, we see this big arc when we start with the cameras um, where there's a real spike in the beginning as people figure out that <laughs> this really matters and I'm going to get a ticket. Um, but we've noted already within a few months about 50% fewer violations for driving in the priority bus lane. So people's behaviors are changing. And I get feedback a lot from people that are frustrated sitting in traffic downtown. And they often will point to the priority bus lanes as that's chewing up a travel lane. And we just really need people to understand that the way we can address congestion is not by removing those bus lanes or bike lanes, but by having more because they make traveling by bus a real option for folks who didn't want to take an hour to get in, but now it's going to take 35 minutes, and people who are sitting in traffic see the buses passing them by, it becomes a more and more inviting alternative. So um, they are so critical <coughs> to the future where we're going. Um, in terms of the downtown revitalization, in terms of really addressing some of our tra traffic volumes. Um, and so they work. So yes, you might not like the ticket. We have video clips to prove. <laughs> so when we get a complaint, we actually have evidence to show you are in the wrong. Um, and so those complaints really do die down. And you're always able to fight it. And you're always able to fight it. You did good. good Just job. tell them to follow the law, right? <laughs> Talking about moving fast in traffic, and by the way, we are going to leave about five minutes for uh, questions at the end here, so if anybody has a question that we didn't get to, you want to bring up a point again, we'll do that uh, at the end. Talking about moving fast in traffic, uh, Secretary Miller, talk to me about toll lanes. Uh, Northern Virginia, I mean 66, the Beltway, 95, right? There's talk about expanding on the south side of the Beltway, express toll lanes. Um, do you think they've made a measurable difference in Virginia? There's, you know, there's obviously strong opinions on both sides, and, and should, uh, should Virginia be looking at more of those? Um, I, they certainly have their place. Um, and Virginia has been greatly benefited by them in many ways. You know, I'm, I'm the guy that came to this job, um, having been on the transportation board for years, and um, tolling in and of itself, just the collection of tolls, is a very inefficient system. 
come up around that. It's very efficient. And um, what we've done in Virginia um, differently than that is we've used them more to manage lanes. Right? So it's not about the efficiency of the collection, it's about managing lanes and moving traffic around and giving opportunities and options that wouldn't otherwise be there. And so we've had some great partnerships with some toll providers, um, some of which are here today. Um, I came up the express lane this morning, hour and a half, basically. I think Jacob was an hour and a half. Breeze right from Richmond. Morning, from Richmond. Mm -hmm. It was reliable, it was on time. Here we are. Things were good. And I looked over to the right, and there were some people that were in a reliably congested area as well. Um, so we've used them successfully, um, very much so. And um, to my earlier point, we're continuing to look at opportunities. We're looking at bi-directional on the 95 express lines. It's a tough one. It's going to be expensive. I'm not sure how we can do it, but it certainly would be a game changer if we could. We're also going to explore and, and look at, and we're already doing this, um, express lines on 495 East. And I'll, and I'll tell you, it gets back to that regional discussion that we had, and, and for good reason, I think. Um, because of air quality, there's a regional body that needs to make sure we keep air quality good in, in this region, and I think that's important. And you can sort of argue over the specifics of all that, but in general, I think that's a, a good concept. But at the end of the day, Maryland and D.C. and Virginia have to decide whose roads are going to get built, and they get to decide on each other's without funding them. And I don't think that's a good model. And frankly, we're just kind of stuck in there right now where we're having some pushback from from people outside Virginia, in Maryland particularly, um, who maybe don't want us to have express lanes in Virginia. And it's not even talking about going into Maryland, it's just in Virginia. And so we need their support to get there, and frankly, um, I'm a believer that you let the state do what the state wants to do. If you need to apportion that pollution somehow and do credits or whatever you do, you do it. But I don't want to tell Maryland how to run their roads, and I don't think Maryland should tell D.C. or for me, how to run ours either. Uh, we need to collaborate, we need to do it together, but at the end of the day, we have voters and people that pay in each of those places, and they're the ones that are supposed to make those decisions. So it's a very difficult situation that we're in there. It would be a great boon if we were able to do it. We would reduce emissions, we'd increase HOV, we'd increase bus and transit, and people would have a reliable trip to the Potomac as I did from Richmond coming up here today. So I, you know, they, they have their place, They've been very beneficial to Virginia, and we're looking at expanding them at least in those two areas. It kind of piggybacks to you, and I think he's talking about the Wilson Bridge, right, going across uh, the, through Alexandria, across the Wilson Bridge. There's obviously been pushback from Maryland leaders um, and some people in Virginia, we should say, as well, about building those across uh, the bridge. Where, where is the state's position? Well, let me be, but let me be clear. This isn't about building them across the bridge either. If I stop them in, in Virginia at Route 1, they still get to decide whether I do that or not. It's not about whether I could come across the bridge. Coming across the bridge, the Maryland owns the bridge. It's a Maryland decision, just like the other bridge. It's a Maryland decision. I'm not weighing in. I'd like them to do it, but I don't own that, right? So we're not talking about just building lanes in Maryland and not having the permission. We're not talking about that at all. We're talking about building lanes only in Virginia. But still, D.C. and Maryland get to tell us, in essence, whether we can do that or not. I don't think that makes a lot of sense the way it's constructed. Secretary? As you know, that bridge was designed for a potential future transit line. So we definitely would explore that uh, initially. Uh, we'll, we'll work with Virginia. I know there's a bit of a process we're still in the middle of right now. But you know, our preference, obviously, is to eventually have transit across that bridge. OK, lightning round time. Uh, really quick question for the group. Who owns Union Station? <laughs> Everybody want to raise their hand? Everyone has a little slice? No, not you? Union Station uh, Corporation. Right. <laughs> uh, Director Kirschbaum, just because it's in the district, obviously there's a lot of movement. I know the Hopscotch Bridge behind the, 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 the station, that's really kind of the first piece of the puzzle. I took a train trip uh, a couple of years ago. I think it was during the height of the pandemic up to New York with my family. And I'll be quite frank, it was, it was disheartening to walk through Union Station the way that it looked at one point. It's starting to make a comeback. What do you see for the station in the future? We're really excited about the plans. We know how critical it is as an asset for the region. Um, the district's 
nexus is, is fairly limited. Um, obviously, the H Street Bridge is kind of the first stage of all this work, um, and we will be starting that soon, and that really does not only involve uh, sort of upgrading the bridge, but we're moving the, tier, the piers um, so that we can expand the, um, the tracks and we can add more tracks. So that's kind of a critical piece for their infrastructure, and we want to make sure that it's designed in a way uh, where we don't have uh, commercial buses, you know, clogging the area. We're trying to do, have things really um, improved in terms of the environment, improved in terms of the, the flow around it. Um, so yeah, we're here to support it, and we think it's going to be really critical in the region. And I mean, this is obviously important for mark service, for VRE service, those kind of things. No, it is important, but it, it, to me, Union uh, Station sort of reflects my first point, which is there's something going on in the market. It, it, nothing changed at that station, except people aren't using it as much because they were traveling different, things have changed, right? But you know, where it was, you know, in a year's time, nothing happened there that changed that, except the market changed. And again, that's sort of the complexity that we're wrestling with uh, that, uh, again, plays out in, in several levels. And that's another prime example of it. You know, Union Station is a great iconic place. Um, Virginia has invested money into D.C. Um, to get to Union Station, the Long Bridge project. Um, and Virginia obviously has an interest in the operational activity at Union Station. I think the hard part is to how to take the operational requirement and turn it into something more than that. Union Station is not just operational. It's much more than that. And frankly, the benefit is different depending on where you live. Right? So we've got a lot of, a lot of use of Union Station, uh, a potential increase in Union Station, so it needs to operate as a good train station, and that needs to have some amenities right, to be a good train station. But it doesn't have to be incredible. right? And so if you want to make it incredible, and it's going to cost a lot of money to make it incredible, and a great economic engine, who reaps the reward of that? And so that becomes the, the struggle. How do, we, how do we put money into something you don't necessarily reap the same reward from? And is it operational or is it something different than that? So that, that will be the, the thing that will be debated and figured out. The numbers are staggering that they've used, and so we'll see how it plays. My own personal observation, if I could just put my two cents in, I miss that circular bar that used to be in the middle, and then it used to be able to go into. I think we should bring that back. That would be a good one, for sure. One vote for bring back the bar. Uh, the circular bar, yeah, in the middle, that's too high. We'll okay. Take a, we'll take a survey. There you go. Thank you. Thanks support. All right, uh, we have time for a couple of questions. If anybody has a question, please. Hey, See if we can get another question in. If anybody else has a question, if not, we can we can lean on that. Anybody else with a question from the crowd? Uh, okay. No. So sure. Did you want to did you want to weigh in on that comment? Hey, listen. I, I, I appreciate the concern. I'm talking about building in Virginia. Obviously, things that happen across the border have an impact. I get that. Um, but I'm, I'm talking about building in Virginia. I'm not talking about building in Maryland. I'm not talking about obviating transit. We've been very clear, extremely clear, over and over in writing. And it's the law, by the way, that that corridor has to remain open for transit. And if we put anything else there, 
and Randy's and his team were able to get uh, Metro there, but you can ask him how long that will be. Um, if they're able to get it there, we will remove what we put there and bring it back to where it was, and that's a guarantee. And so this is not about obviating transit. This is about that's not going to happen for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, if ever. And in the meantime, we're clogged up, we're, we're polluting the environment, we have unreliable traffic, people are wasting time, and I can go out there and make it better for all those people in a few years, and we're not allowed to do it yet. Paul, real quickly, uh, we got about a minute left. Where's the purple line? What's going on with it? Good progress? Yeah, purple line's moved very well. As you know, we pretty much have come out of the ground, which has made a big difference. Uh, we're out of the University of Maryland, for instance, which was a huge issue for our, our flagship university. I haven't heard about the traffic there at all. What's that? I have not heard about the traffic no, there. No, there's, uh, for sure. And uh, um, I mean, particularly in, in this area, you know, just think back, you know, 30, 20 years of all the traffic impacts when we built Metro. And, you know, it's very, very painful. I get it. But we all know the long term benefits of, of that project is what we do with Metro. Um, so we'll get past that as quickly as we can. We're all we're pushing almost 70% done. Uh, we're looking at 27 to be totally done and have it open for every service. So uh, no, no it's going very well. All right, well, I think we're, well, 10, 15, no, 11. My clock just said 11, sorry. I was gonna try to sneak one more in. I hear we have a heart at 11 o'clock. But thank you to the panel today for everything. <laughs> Thanks so many might stick around for extra questions. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you to the board of trade. Thanks to the board of trade. Thanks for the partnership. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. All right, Adam and uh, Chef Shannon and uh, uh, Paul, thank you uh, yes. very much for uh, joining us today. Thank you all for uh, joining us today. We just want to close things out. Um, uh, okay, we're going to be quick. This is always the fun part I get at the, at the end to get everybody to be quiet for one more minute. I want to thank everybody. Every voice is so important. The work that you're doing is so important. We clearly have a very significant charge ahead. And today was a great example of great minds coming out. And now going forward, we have a lot of work to do. So I do want to thank our guests. I want to thank our speakers um, for their willingness and their incredible insight in sharing where we are today and where we need to go going forward. Jack, I want to thank you again um, for the partnership. Again, this is our seventh year, and these conversations are critical today, but as we move forward, so at a minimum, we will see these faces collectively next year, but by next year, I hope we are driving the progress that we need to, Randy, and the work that we are doing together, but as we have these significant investments and projects throughout the region. Thanks, everyone.